So far, we've clarified four key terms, hermeneutics, exegesis, eisegesis, and homiletics, and also talked about their interrelationship. So maybe now we're ready to finally get to that hermeneutic and see what those guidelines or principles for interpretation are. However, before we do that, we have to deal with an objection. We have to talk about the necessity of biblical hermeneutics. And that's because you might be listening, and you might indeed have an objection. You might be listening to everything I've said so far, and you might be saying to yourself, hermeneutics, smermeneutics. I don't need to study this course. I don't need some egghead professor from Calvin Theological Seminary to come along and tell me what the Bible quote-unquote really means as if I can't figure it out by myself. No, the Bible is quite simple and clear. All I have to do is read it and do what it says. In fact, that objection that you might have, I've heard in a song. I haven't heard it lately, but on the Christian radio station, it went something like this. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. I mean, maybe that's your perspective. God said it, I believe it, and so I don't need to take these online courses. I don't need to think about this business called hermeneutics. In fact, I bet you this hermeneutics is some liberal, left-leaning way to get about what the Bible really means. So again, how am I going to respond to such an objection? Well, my response is going to be both a kind of a yes and a no. On one hand, I'm going to affirm this person's objection and say, wait a minute, I believe like you do in the perspicuity of Scripture. Now, don't be intimidated by the word perspicuity. It's just a fancy word which refers to the clarity or the clearness of the Bible. On this image, you can see that the woman in the front is clear and the person in the back is uh, out of focus. And so the word perspicuity has to do with the clarity, the clearness of the Bible and its meaning and its teachings. And the perspicuity of Scripture actually was a big teaching of the Reformers. In fact, of Calvin and Luther and others, and as a person who is not only a Protestant Christian, but a Reformed Christian, of course then, I would have to believe in the perspicuity of Scripture. But if you're going to use this term and this idea of the clarity of Scripture, you have to be careful you use it in the right way. And for that, I want to uh, explore with you again how the Reformers thought about this business called the perspicuity of Scripture. In other words, you need to have a proper historical understanding of the term perspicuity. Now, the Reformers use this idea, not only the term perspicuity, but again the idea that Scripture and its teachings were clear and uh, straightforward. They use this because they were reacting to a situation in the Roman Catholic Church. In the church at that time, the common person didn't have the Bible. It's kind of like that, that, that movie, you know, you can't handle the truth. Well, some people were saying to parishioners that you can't handle the Bible. Only the trained laity, the magisterium, the priest, and the church leaders, they're the only ones who are equipped to handle the Bible. In fact, the Bible wasn't even in a language where the common person could understand. That's one of the reasons why Luther was so eager to translate the Bible into German, so the common person could read and then also hear the gospel for themselves. And so the Reformers came along in that kind of context and said, no, you don't have to be a priest or a trained theologian to interpret the Bible. No, they argued that the teachings of the Bible were perspicuous, right? They were clear. And so again, I want to affirm, as perhaps you do now, the perspicuity of Scripture. But, and here comes an important correction, when the Reformers argued for the perspicuity, the clarity of Scripture, they didn't mean that everything in the whole Bible was simple or easy to understand. And they didn't mean that for a very good reason. They knew of texts like 2 Peter 3, verse 16, which says, there are some things in them, that is, the letters of Paul, that are hard to understand. And you probably say, Amen, Peter, that's right, I read Paul, and there are some things in there that are not easy to get my mind around. And think about this text for a moment if you're hesitating a little bit about this business of hermeneutics. If one apostle, if one inspired writer of the Bible says about another apostle, another part of Scripture, that this, part, this writer has some things in them that are hard to understand, are you now so vain 
Are you so proud as to say, not for me, I mean, you know, Peter may have had a hard time understanding uh, Paul, but not me, it's all clear and easy for me to understand. Is that really the position you want to have? And the Reformers also knew of another text, like Acts 8, 26 to 40, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember how the Spirit kind of caught up Philip and brought him to this guy from Africa. He had, obviously, a roll or scroll in front of him, and he was reading from the prophecy of Isaiah. And then Philip said to him, Sir, do you understand what you're reading? And then comes the answer that we all know so well. You know that answer, don't you? He said, Of course I do, Philip. Don't you believe in the perspicuity of Scripture? Well, wait a minute. No, that's not what he said. No, he instead said, how can I understand unless somebody explains it to me? And so again, I suggest to you, even though the reformers argued for the perspicuity, the clearness of Scripture, they did not argue that everything in the whole Bible was simple or easy to understand. And so the reformers apparently had a more restricted or narrow sense of the term perspicuity. They used the word perspicuity to refer to what? To things in the Bible, not only that were taught clearly, but things in the Bible that we need to know to be saved. Okay, they didn't argue that everything in the Bible was simple or easy to understand, but those things that we need to know to experience salvation, those things, those, if you will, essential teachings of the Bible are taught in a clear way. What are those essential teachings? I guess things like that God exists, that he reveals himself as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that uh, salvation is not by works, anything that humans can achieve, but by God's undeserved favor made possible through Christ's sacrifice, that the Christian life is a holy life. I mean, these are the central teachings of Scripture that you don't need to take an online course, right, from this place to understand. Even little children, even my kids when they were younger, can understand those truths. And so again, that's what we mean, that's what the Reformers meant by the perspicuity of Scripture. But this also means that there are other parts of the Bible that are not so easy to understand. And actually, this makes common sense, because we're separated, we're distanced from the Bible in all kinds of ways. We're distanced from it linguistically. The Bible is written in Greek and Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic. Most of us don't know those languages. And so we're separate from the text by virtue of language. We're distanced from the text uh, geographically. Most of us live in North America or in other parts of the world and aren't really familiar with the Middle East and those geographical places where the biblical stories took place. We're separate by geography. We're separate by time. We live in a modern era in a post-rationalistic age. The biblical uh, period obviously happened a long, long time ago. And so we're separate from the Bible in all kinds of ways. No wonder it is at times difficult to understand. And so for those parts of the scripture that are more challenging for us to understand, we need a, well, not just a hermeneutic, I have to add an adjective, we need a good hermeneutic in order for us to properly do exegesis to understand what God meant, because once we understand what God meant, then we can be confident about what God means for the church today. Or to say it again differently, once we have a good hermeneutic, or we need a good hermeneutic, in order to hear the then and there of the biblical text, and be confident about that, so that we can equally be confident when we apply it to the here and now. And so if you're listening to this and you're the hermeneutics, smermeneutics person who thinks this isn't really necessary, this is maybe just a clever smokescreen by professors like me to get around the real meaning of the text, wait a minute, um, don't too quickly use the word perspicuity if you're not using it in the right sense. Yes, I believe in the perspicuity of Scripture. But again, with the Reformers, I want to limit that in a more narrow sense to those teachings in the Bible that are essential for us to be saved. And yet there are other parts of the scripture that are difficult for us to understand, and we need not just a hermeneutic, but we need a good hermeneutic. Or in other words, hermeneutics is a necessary and legitimate activity. Well, that's my first response to uh, an objection that you might have, but I have a second one, too, and it goes like this. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, I have some quotes here about the perspicuity of Scripture from some reformers to show you that this is not just my idea. Uh, but notice what they say. Luther says, I admit, of course, there are many texts in the Scriptures that are obscure and abstruse. That's quite surprising. Here's the same guy who argued for the perspicuity of Scripture, and yet he says there are many texts in the Bible that are obscure. And he says, not because of the majesty of their subject matter, but because of our ignorance of their vocabulary and grammar. And these texts in no way hinder a knowledge of all the subject matter of Scripture. I have a quote here also from the Westminster Confession. The Westminster Confession is a very popular and widely held Reformed Confession. And this is a good quote because it, it shows you um, in print this more narrow or restricted view of perspicuity that I've suggested to you. The Confession says, All things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. Right? Not everything in the Scripture is equally clear. But what things are? Those things which are, to be, which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation. Do you see how they limit it? Those things that are necessary. Not the things that we would like to know, but the things that we need to know, believe, and observe for salvation. Those things are so clearly propounded and open in some place of Scripture or the other that not only the learned, not only the egghead professor types, but anyone in a due use of the ordinary means may attain to a sufficient understanding of them. I also have a quote from the Belgic Confession. The Belgic Confession is not as well known as the Westminster Confession. It's one unique to my own tradition, but it's a very helpful uh, uh, manual for instructing new believers. And I love the way the Belgic Confession says just enough, but not too much, about Scripture. The Belgic Confession doesn't claim too much about the Bible. Notice what it says. Second, and the confession is dealing with the two ways by which we know God. We know God through the world, we call that general revelation, and we know him through the word, we call that special revelation. And so now it's dealing with that second special revelation. It's talking about scripture, the Bible. So secondly, God makes himself known to us more openly than in general revelation by what? His holy and divine will. And then this very modest phrase, as much as we need in this life for his glory and the salvation of his own. I, I love how modest this is. The confession does not say that the Bible answers every question we have in life and in death. You might want it to say that, but the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible doesn't answer, frankly, every question we have in life and death. But what it does do, it answers all the questions we need to know, right? For two things to happen, the confession says, for God to be glorified and for us to be saved. The Bible does that perfectly clearly. The Bible perfectly clearly makes known as much as we need for him to be glorified and for us to be saved. Well, I was about to uh, introduce to you a second, and uh, here we go, a second response to the hermeneutics, smermeneutics objection, or if you think that maybe this business of hermeneutics isn't legitimate or necessary, and the second response goes like this. It's not as if I have a hermeneutic, therefore I'm liberal and bad, and you don't have a hermeneutic, therefore you're conservative and good. I want to suggest to you that we all have a hermeneutic already. It's just a question of whether it's a good one or a bad one. Well, I'll give you an example. I call this uh, the Mrs. Uh, Smith example. I can't use a real name because I don't want this person to be identified and may be embarrassed, but Mrs. Smith is a real person and she is a very good friend of my mother-in-law. And I happen to know Mrs. Smith because uh, she was a member of a church that I was a member of for a while and I know that Mrs. Smith uh, a while ago was unhappy with our church and left our church and went to another one and subsequently has gone to yet a third church. And anyway, I was visiting home one time and I heard Mrs. Smith talking with my mother-in-law and Mrs. Smith was complaining about her pastor. She said about her pastor this, she said, he doesn't take the whole Bible literally. Now, if I were a wiser person, I wouldn't have said anything. But instead, uh, in my perhaps foolishness, I jumped in and I said, Mrs. Smith, you don't take the whole Bible literally. And she kind of went, oh, you know, how dare you say such a terrible thing? And I said to her, well, I said, 
I said, the Bible says, um, if your right hand caused you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. And if your right eye caused you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. And I wonder why, Mrs. Smith, you still have your right hand and your right eye. You see, she didn't take the whole Bible literally after all, even though she didn't realize it. You see, she must have had a rule, a guideline, you might call it. She must have had a hermeneutic, some sense that she shouldn't take those verses literally. And she was right, actually, in that. We'll explain that later on. That's a form of hyperbole, the gross use of exaggeration in order to make a more memorable point. But my point is, she had a hermeneutic. She had a lens by which she was reading the scripture. She had some kind of principle or guideline in her thinking which allowed her not to take that verse literally, even though she didn't realize it. And so again, I say to you, it's not as if I have a hermeneutic, therefore I'm liberal and bad, and you don't have a hermeneutic, therefore you're conservative and good. Everybody has a hermeneutic already. Everybody has some kind of lens by which they interpret the Bible, some kind of principle that they follow for interpreting the scriptures. And so the whole question is whether we're aware of that hermeneutic that you have and whether or not it's a good one or a bad one. And it seems to me it's a lot more healthy to be upfront and to acknowledge the lens that we have or the lens that we ought to have. Why? So that we can, as the title of this series puts it, we can read the Bible for all it's worth. Well, I hope then that you realize now that, well, we have to keep on with this series. So we just you know, if it weren't the case, of course, we could just stop, pack up, and go home. But no, hermeneutics is indeed a valid, yes, a necessary thing. And so let's continue on in our quest to, uh, to know and to follow a good hermeneutic. Let's continue on in this uh, quest to read the Bible for all it's worth.